Okay, now we go to the questions. Uh, the first question here, Isaiah 53, verse 5. So here is about our salvation. Now I want to say this uh, the, uh, for the leaders, please, when you s have any questions, please send it uh, to the group. But don't send uh, unnecessary information. When you send the questions, I will answer later. And also, if you cannot see me clearly, please tell me. And then when you can see and hear me clearly, please tell me. And then I know uh, where you are. So this is very, very important. So I hope you all uh, realize it's important for me to understand what's going on there. I need to know what's going on. So let me know if you're not seeing me well. And let me know if you see me well. So this is very important. Okay. Okay. Now, um, I'm sorry. I have to adjust this. Make sure it's working well. Okay. Now, um, okay. So if you can see me clearly, please tell me too. Okay. Now, um, Isaiah 53 verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. So Jesus was pierced for what reason? He was pierced for our transgressions, to pay for the penalties of our sin, because God is just. Every sin has to be paid for before the person is forgiven. God cannot just forgive us by saying, oh, okay, I forgive you. Now, people can do that, but God cannot do that because God is perfectly just. Every sin has to be paid for. And Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. He has no sins at all. So when he died for us innocently, he really did not have to die for us, but he became curse for us. He became sin for us. And then when we, so he paid for the penalties of our sins. So when we trust in him as our savior, then we are saved. So Jesus was pierced for, for our sins, to cover our sins, to pay for our sins. How does his death pay for our sins? Uh, so his death, because it satisfied the requirements of God. It satisfied, it satisfied the requirement of God that all sins had to be has to be punished. So Jesus was punished for our sins. What two other benefits does the death of Jesus bring us? So in this verse, it tell, tell us that for the transgressions, for the forgiveness of the sins, and then also to bring us peace. So it will bring us peace. Peace in Hebrew, he, uh, shalom, it means uh, the completeness of the whole person. So it, it means the peace of the mind, peace of the spirit, uh, peace of the body, everything in peace. Okay. Um, now you can all see, right? I mean, uh, if you have problem, please tell me. Okay. If you don't have problem, then I will continue. Um, okay. Uh, so what are the other two benefits are peace, and then by his wounds we are healed. So. He heals us. He brings healing to us. Now this is a, another big issue. Some people say, how come uh, someone is not healed? That's something we cannot answer. Uh, the Bible did not tell us all the reasons. The Bible tells us that Paul has sickness when he first uh, went to uh, Galatia. Uh, and then um, and then uh, Timothy was sick many times, and uh, so also the co-workers of, of, of Paul. So uh, even though Jesus can uh, give us healing, it's not, uh, not every Christian are healed. But we, we found that when we trust in God more, uh, we have more health and more healing. And we, but we cannot say that somebody has sickness is because someone doesn't, uh, doesn't believe enough. We cannot accuse people like that. Okay, number two, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him 
who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So the verse here says that He made Him who knew no sin, the one who knew no sin is Jesus Christ. He knew no sin. He has not committed any sin. He has no relationship with any sin. So He became sin for us. He became the representation of sin. All the sins of the whole world is, was upon Him. So he, so, uh, he became sin, the representation of sin. So who is Him who knew no sin? That's Jesus Christ. What does it mean that God made Jesus to be sin? Because He, all the sins in the whole world of everyone came upon Him. So He, be, he Himself became sin. So what is the benefit of that? The benefit is that then all our sins has been paid for by Him. He was punished for all our sins. Okay, and then um, what does it mean that we become the righteousness of God? That the righteousness of God will come upon us. We are clothed with, with the righteousness of God. That we are clothed in, with this. Uh, uh, not only are we forgiven, not only are the sins forgiven, Given, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ that means how he has perfectly obeyed the law that is the righteousness righteousness means obedience of the law so Jesus has obeyed the whole law so this righteousness came upon us so we are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ and in Isaiah 61 Isaiah 61 verse 10 talk about that we were clothed with this righteousness and his salvation and we can rejoice in that. Okay, Galatians 3.13 Christ was re has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Christ was redeemed uh, has redeemed us from the curse of the law that we are not cursed by the law anymore because Jesus has become a curse for us because it's, it was written that cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now it's very uh, interesting that in the Old Testament at that time there was no cross but already God knew that Jesus Christ would be crucified. So he said that when a person is hang on a tree then he will be cursed. So that in a way is prophesying that Jesus Christ one day he was uh, hang on a tree because uh, the cross is made from a tree and then he was hang on a tree and then he was cursed uh, by God. He was cursed by God. He became the curse. The total curse of all people came upon him. So what does Christ becoming a curse for us mean? That means he became the summation, the summary of all curses that He has paid for all our sins so that He can remove us from all curses. So what, what benefit does it bring to us that we are forgiven and cleansed from our sins and also we are saved from curses? Now, um, and here, what did Jesus do to the curse? Uh, what did Jesus do? Uh, uh, to the curses. Now um, I should rephrase this. So what? Uh, so what did the curse do to Jesus? Uh, what you know? Uh, or what it mean is? So when he has all the curse on himself, what did he do? He died for us. He paid for all the curses. He paid for all the curses. Do we have to be afraid of curses, including generation curses? How do we protect ourselves? Now, there is a teaching of generation curses. I'm sure that most of you have heard about it. And it's based on, in the Old Testament, it says that, that the father, uh, God the Father will chase after us for our sins from the f Father to the second and third generation. And many people say that, well, then the sins of your fathers, your forefathers, then uh, their sins will come upon you and be a curse to you. And so they teach that you have to repent of the curses of your father and your, or your 
grandfather and great grandfather so that the curses would not come upon us. I want to say that that verse says that God is the God is the one who will punish people for the sins of the for the ancestors. But the Bible also tells us that uh, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter twenty eight that all those who obey God will be blessed by God in every way, blessed by God. And in the New Testament, Jesus said very clearly, Blessed is everyone who hear my word and obey the words. And also in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, it says that what God has prepared for those who love Him is something that the eyes have not seen, the ear has not heard, and the human mind has not thought of. So when we obey Him, He will prepare for us great, great, great blessings far beyond any kind of curse. So it's very clear that we are uh, free from all curses. But many people have this thought. They have to pray for the sins, you know, ask for forgiveness of the sins of the father and forefathers so that they are cleansed from the curse of these sins. Now, when you look at the whole Bible, it doesn't teach that. Actually, actually there is no Bible verse that talk about generation curse. It's only said that the Father will punish, uh, God the Father will punish the, uh, the, the children, uh, the, you know, uh, get after the children and the great-grandchildren of the person who has committed sin. But if this person obeys God, the Bible already is very clear that he's not cursed at all. That he's blessed by, blessed by God is very clear from the Bible. But people like to blame other reasons. Why bad things happen to them? Why I have sickness? Why the family has all kinds of problems? Now, I want to say this. If people don't trust in Jesus, yes, they can be cursed from their sins. If they don't trust in Jesus, and when they don't take care of their sins, and they don't uh, take care of the problems in their life, they are controlled by sins and anger and frustration. Then what they do is they should build up a strong relationship with God and trust in the love of God and take care of the sins and the negative thinking, negative emotions and relational problems. They take care of all these problems and then none of the curses can come to Him. So the solution is not by just praying for forgiveness for the forefathers, but to ask for forgiveness for our sins and to manage our lives so that we, are, we don't follow the sinful ways. And then God's blessing will come upon us and God's blessing will take away all the curses. So this generation curse caused many people to have fear. What, what kind of fear? They will say, oh, I don't know why I have all this kind of sickness and they don't know what to do. And they have asked someone to, to pray for the forefathers, uh, pray for the sin of the forefathers and repent for them. And then they still have sickness. They say, well, I don't know where the curses come from. And they are afraid. And uh, the verses I quote just now, that God blesses those who believe in Him and follow Him and obey Him and love Him. And this will cancel any curse. So we don't have to fear anything. Now, but if people live in sin, then they can be cursed from the, by Satan. The curse came from Satan when they sin, when they don't take care of their negative emotions and, and uh, negative thinking and the relational problem with people. Then all this will bring problems and curses from the devil. So we have to discern where the curses come from and then we take care of the problems instead of take uh, working on things that the Bible did not tell us to do. Now the Bible does talk about repenting for uh, sins of the uh, forefathers, that Old Testament has prayers like this. We can do that. But we don't have to say, well, I don't know why all this problem comes from, so I have to check out my forefathers, what sins they have committed, and then I have to <clears throat> ask God to forgive each one of them. If I miss anyone, then I can be punished by God. And if we look at the whole Bible, we don't see that teaching. 
in the book of Acts and in the epistles of Paul, in the book of Acts, he went ar around to different places. He taught people. And then in the epistles, he taught people how to follow God. Paul never talked about generation curses. He never talked about curses. Actually, he says that the curse has been on Jesus already. So we are not cursed. But when we love God and obey God, then we are blessed. Now, the reason why I spend time on this, because I know this is a teaching that has affected many people. And many people have a lot of fear because of that. So I hope you will study the Bible passages about the promises when we love God and obey God. And then we can be sure that we are blessed by God when we love Him and obey Him. We don't have to be afraid of generation curses. And then if people have the problem of the sins, the sinful behavior, then the source it come from uh, the sinful behavior. And then we need to repent and turn away from the sins and obey God. Now, do the parents affect us? Yes, they do. They affect us in the sense that we can learn from them and they have negative influences upon us. It's true. So we want to say no to those influences. When our fathers have been lying, have been committing adultery, we want to turn away from those sins. We don't want those sins to affect us. And then we don't have to be afraid of generation curses. Okay. Okay, now penalty of sin, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Why is there a wage of sin? Uh, because God is just. So every sin has a price. And the price is death, eternal death. It's very serious. God cannot just say, I forgive you. The person has to go through Jesus Christ to be forgiven. So we have to tell people about Jesus Christ so that they can be forgiven and saved. There is no other way. They have to go through Jesus Christ. And even in the Old Testament, now in the book of Hebrews, it talks about that Jesus has died for the sins of the people in the previous covenant. In the Old Testament, the cows, uh, the sheep cannot pay for the sins of the people. It's only Jesus Christ. And the cows and the sheep is a uh, uh, representation of, it's a figure of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, that it's Jesus Christ who pay for the sins and then they can be forgiven uh, in the Old Testament. So for all people uh, from Adam to the last person in the whole world, they're all forgiven because of the death of Jesus Christ. Matthew 25, 41. Then he shall also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting uh, fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. Now hell was prepared uh, by, uh, for, for Satan and his angels, not prepared for people. Uh, so if people don't trust in Jesus, they will, uh, they will stay in hell forever. So this verse tells us that um, that the hellfire is prepared for the devil and his angels. Uh, so it was not prepared for people. It was prepared for Satan and his angels. Only when people don't listen to and respond to the gospel that they will have to go to hell. Okay, we are saved by grace through faith. Now these are very important teachings, even though some of you may have you know, heard it and uh, taught it. It's very important that we teach this very, very clearly. Ephesians 2.8, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by work, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Why can we be saved by works? Now, so this verse says that for it is by grace. Grace is unmerited blessings from God, unmerited salvation and all the blessings. We are saved by grace. We don't deserve it. That we have been saved through faith by trusting in Jesus Christ. When we trust in Jesus Christ, then we can have forgiveness of sin and salvation. And this is not from yourself, not from ourselves. It's not our, what we do. It is the gift of God. And not by work, so that no one can boast. It's not by our good works. 
For we are God's handiwork. Handiwork means creation. We are God's creation created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So we are saved not by good works, but we are saved so that we can do good works. We are saved so that we can glorify God and tell people about Jesus and live out the fruit of salvation, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, so that we will manifest the glory of God, so the people can see that the people of God are holy and full of love. So why can't we be saved by works? Because we are never perfect. If we want to be saved by works, we have to be perfect uh, in every single way. And in, we have to be perfect in our nature. We, we have a sinful nature, so we can never be perfect. Perfect in our thoughts, perfect in our words, and perfect in our works. Everything in our lives has to be perfect before we can come in front of God. But nobody is perfect. Um, what does it mean that we are saved by grace through faith? By grace means that it's, it's a free gift. It's a free gift from God that Jesus Christ died for us. He did not charge us for His salvation. It's a free gift given to us through faith that when we trust in Jesus, then we have salvation. And faith is not something we can boast of. For instance, if someone is about to drown and someone save him, he would not say, well, I almost drowned, but well, I, I was willing to hold on to the hand of this person. He would not say that because people would say, you're crazy. He saved you and you say you, you are willing to hold on to his hands. You should say, He's, he is willing to save you. That's grace. That's, that's blessing to you. So we should not boast of our faith and say, I did believe in Jesus. It's nothing to be boast of because faith is just the way we receive the blessings of God. It's like the beggar. He has no food. And then someone give, gives him food and then he just receives it. That is faith. Faith is how we receive the blessings of God, the undeserved grace of God. So it's, it's a way we receive the blessings of God. Faith is not something we can boast of. So we are saved by grace, by His uh, free, uh, fr free gift through faith in Him. What does it mean that we are God's handiwork created to do good works? That means God saved us and He put, put the Holy Spirit inside us to change us, to give us a new nature so that we are born again. And then we are, when we are born again, we are a new person. The new person has the motivation to uh, not to sin, and has the motivation to obey God and love God and glorify God. So this is the handiwork, the new creation in us. And uh, to, uh, to be created to do good work so that we can obey God and glorify God. Uh, it's because God created this nature in us. And we have to understand this. Um, we still have the sinful nature. That's why we still will sin. We will still sin. Uh, so we have to uh, read the Bible and pray much and take care of our sins so that our new nature will grow, so that our sinful nature will be suppressed. Whenever the sinful nature is sinning, we have to say no to the sinful thoughts. Immediately we say, I don't want to sin. I don't want to offend God. I don't want to hurt my life. I want to obey God and glorify God. And this is, this is something it's, uh, it's, it will bring blessings to me and it will raise my life to a higher level. So I want to obey God and I want to take care of the sin so that my life is uh, fully uh, manifesting, showing the glory of God. What is the relationship between salvation and good works? It's very important. We're not saved by good works. We are saved by grace through faith. But we are saved to do good. If a person doesn't do good at all, after he's, he said he believed in Jesus, then there is something wrong with his faith. Then maybe he did not understand faith. He did not understand the consequences of sin. When we understand the consequences, of sin, understand the blessings of God in Jesus Christ, then we will hold on to Jesus and say, I want to be saved, I want, I want to be forgiven. And then when we have this desire to be saved, then a new life will come out in us. 
And this new life we want to obey God and and follow God and love people. So this is uh, and the new nature in us. And and then the new nature will produce good works. If someone doesn't have the motivation to do good at all, then he need to really repent and realize that his sins can and can bring eternal damnation. So he needs to ask God for forgiveness and and ask God to give his, him eternal life and ask God to change his life so that he will love righteousness, love to glorify God. The more we pray and the more we read the Bible and meditate on the Bible, that the more we will have uh, the fruit of salvation. First John 1 John 1.9 If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why can't many people believe that God really forgives them? So if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just. He is faithful, that means He will keep His promise. He said that He will forgive us when we repent of our sin. He is faithful and He is just. That means He is fair because He has already paid for our sins by sending Jesus to die for us. So He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why can't many people believe that God really forgives them? Because people want to say, I have to do something for my sins in order that I, uh, that I deserve forgiveness. So people have this feeling, I have to do something to deserve forgiveness. Now, God is not people. For people, you have to do something to make them happy. But for God, when we trust in Him and just take the free gift, God is very happy. Now for people, most people, don't want us to just to take the free gift. They want us to pay the price. But for God, He just wants us to, to uh, take the free gift. And so we are not used to taking free gifts from people. So it's hard for us to, to believe that God really forgives us. And also many people have misconception of God. They think that God is very, very angry, uh, very mean, uh, very stern. And he doesn't forgive easily. He doesn't love us much. And uh, now in the first sessions, I talk about the love of God. How to live in the love of God. That God really loves us. We are precious in the sight of God. And uh, he's, he, he sent His Son to die for us. And He sent the Holy Spirit to move in our hearts so that we'll believe in Him. And then when we trust in Him, He's very, very happy. So anytime we trust in Jesus, He is very, very happy. And any, many times we obey Him and love Him and pray to Him, He's very, very happy and He will bless us. So we understand that God has this very positive attitude to us, toward us. And He's very happy to forgive us and, and cleanse us from our sins. So this is something we need to learn. And also the people in the world don't forgive easily. People don't forgive easily. Many times people come to me and say, I have some problem with another person. I say, can I talk with you both and try to reconcile the relationship? And then they say, no, I don't want to do it. Uh, it's too hard. He won't forgive. Uh, it's hard, impossible. It's very easy for people to think that way. Because people don't forgive easily. And we want to learn to understand that Jesus really is willing to forgive. He's very happy to forgive. Actually, when one sinner repents, the whole heaven will rejoice. And also we need to learn this nature of God, always want to forgive and not to look at the shortcomings of people and to be willing to forgive. After we forgive, we'll try to guide a person with love and gentleness to guide this person to repentance. Not to force them to repent, but to love them, to accept them, to accept them first and guide them to repentance. This is very important that we have the attitude of grace, not an attitude of the law. Now, many people have the attitude of the law. They, have, they want to condemn people. They want to accuse people. They want to uh, point out the mistakes of people with harsh words. We want to speak gently and tell people, God loves you and I love you. You are precious. And we want to guide you to, uh, first we accept them and forgive them. And then we ask them, are you willing to to be blessed by God and do you want to be able to take care of the uh, uh, some problems in your life 
Uh, so are you willing to do that? And if you're willing, so uh, what can we do? So this is guiding people to repentance and to change the behavior. This is what we have talked about in counseling. It's guiding people, accepting people is very, very important. So I hope we all remember this deeply in our heart that we don't want to treat people with the law. Now, if there is some problem, we first want to accept and forgive. And then we guide them and say, okay, what are some possible problems? Did I do anything wrong? If I have done anything wrong, please forgive me. Uh, and what, so there are some problems existing. What can we do to correct it? So we want to talk in a way to make people realize that we want to forgive. We want to reconcile. We don't want to continue to have unforgiveness and hatred. Okay, Psalm 51, 17. Now, what I just said is very important. I hope we will put the grace of God into our lives. It's not just believing that we are forgiven, but we live a life of forgiveness, that we want to forgive people and be uh, a blessing to people. And, and this is hard to do. It's not very hard if you have the grace of God filling your heart. It's hard to do when people are not willing to forgive, when people want to... Just look at the sins of people and when people want to accuse other people. Okay, Psalm 51, 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. This, O oh God, you will not despise. So the sacrifice of God are a broken spirit. What God wants to, us to offer is our broken spirit, a repentant spirit, a heart that is sorry for our sins, a broken and contrite heart. Contrite means to be sorry for our sins. A broken and contrite heart, God will not despise. So anyone who is sorry for the sins, God will not despise. God will treasure it. So what is the difference between just saying we have sinned against God and being contrite? Just saying we have sinned, it's, some people say, I have repented already. They think repentance is everything. It's not just repenting, but being feeling sorry. Yes, I have sinned against you, Lord. I am very sorry. That sin offends you and sin will hurt my life. I'm very sorry for my sins. That's contrite heart. It's not just saying with the mouth, but being really sorry. And that's why some people are not changed when they, are, when they believe in Jesus because they don't have a contrite heart. They just say they believe in Jesus. They just ask God to forgive the sins. But we want to have a contrite heart and say, Yes, Lord, I have sinned against you. I really have sinned and I deserve eternal punishment. But you are willing to forgive me. That's a great gift. So how can we build up our remorse for sin? How can we build our remorse for sin? That we have to read the Bible and understand that the penalty of sin is very heavy. Eternal punishment is very, very heavy. And uh, there the fire does not cease and the worms will not die, that they will continue to hurt people in hell. So hell is a place of punishment and continual, punish, uh, continual suffering. And, uh, and any sin can cause us to go to hell. So we want to uh, be sorry for our sins. If we're not sorry for our sins, even when people say, please forgive me, but they're not sorry for the sins and they continue to sin, they will not be forgiven and they don't have eternal life. So when people say, okay, forgive my sins, and then they just continue to sin, they are not remorseful for the sins. They are not feeling sorry for the sins. So how will God respond when we are remorseful? God will always forgive us. God is always happy. God will have, the whole heaven will rejoice when we uh, repent of our sins. Okay, and then Luke 15, 7. I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no for repentance. So there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. The one sinner repents and over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Now here Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. These Pharisees, they think they don't need repentance. So Jesus is not talking about the righteous Christian, but he's talking about the uh, people who think they don't need repentance. And God rejoices over the one person who, 
who is really sorry for his sins. Why is there heaven joy in heaven when one sinner repents? Because God has a forgiving heart. God has a heart to forgive people and give salvation to people. God wants all his children to come to him. God wants a family of all his children. God has great, great love. So God has this love and acceptance of people. So whenever people repent, God is very, very happy because when a person is forgiven and saved and then brought back to his side, God is very happy to see his children come back to him. That's why he rejoices. So what does this tell us about God's nature? God's nature is a nature of forgiveness, acceptance, that he likes people, that he treasures people, that he wants people to be saved and want people to come to him. Can this help us to have confidence to come to God when we have sinned? So we know that when we repent, the whole heaven will rejoice. It will give us confidence. Yes, when I come to Him, He will be very happy. Not only when we first repented, but every time when we repent, God is very, very happy. And then I can apply it to not only when we repent, when we pray to Him, when we love Him, He's very happy also. So whatever we do, according to God's way, whenever we obey Him and repent and pray to Him and love Him and, and tell people about Jesus and help people's spiritual life and teach according to the Word of God, God is very happy to accept us. So we have the confidence, anything we do right according to God, God is very happy. Then doing right is from the heart, that we do follow God's commandment in the Bible. Now, I want to distinguish following the grace of God to obey God. It's motivate, motivated by the grace of God to obey Him. It's different from legalism. Legalism is depending on the law to please God, depending on the law to, to feel loved by God. So everything they think they have to do good enough. Now, I want to do good. I want to do good. But I don't want to... My, motiv my motivation is not that I have to do good and then God will loves me, love me. God always loves me. And God will always respond whenever I repent to Him and trust in Him. Legalism is looking at what they've done and say to God, I've done all these good things. And then they will look at other people and say, I'm, I'm better than they are. They try to please God with just what they do. And they think they are better than other people. And they are critical toward other people or t critical toward themselves. So we don't want to be critical. We want to be rejoicing in God and enjoying God. Now, some of you may say these lessons are basic Christianity. I want to say this, it is basic Christianity, but many people are not very clear when they explain this salvation and this heart of God, this forgiveness of God and God's heart toward us. So I hope we all can learn this and see God is full of grace, God is full of love and acceptance, God is very beautiful. So we want to come to God for forgiveness and for salvation and we can enjoy Him and we can be motivated by Him to obey God. Now that is not legalism. Legalism is, is uh, just looking at the actions in order to please God. And they don't believe that God really accepts them. Okay. Um, so we can have confidence to come to God. Why do many people want to hide from God when they have sinned? Because this is our sinful nature. Just as Adam and Eve, when they first sinned, they hid from God. So many people, when they sin, they say, I don't deserve to come to God, and then they dare not pray. But I want to say this. If we have sinned and then we come to God right away, God is very happy. God is most happy when we repent at that time and come to God Lord and say Lord I need you I need you I I need your forgiveness please for, please forgive me God is most happy when we do that so we not do not be afraid to come to God when we have sinned now that has happened to me many times but now when I understand God's nature immediately I'll say God you're happy to forgive me and I'm very sorry for my sins please help me to overcome the sins and don't sin at all and at all and don't have any sinful thought so I have the confidence to come to God right away and then I can stop the sin whenever I have this sinful thought whenever I have any anger toward 
the person, the immediately I say, Lord, please forgive me and give me uh, love and acceptance for the person uh, so that I can put down all the anger and frustration. That when I have the confidence to come to God right away, then I have the strength. But when people don't have the confidence, they will say, Oh God, I've sinned and I, I don't want to pray now. I, I'm, I'm afraid. And then they hide from God. And what happens is they will sin more. They feel bad. When people feel bad, they will sin more to, in order to make themselves feel better. We want to feel better because of God's love and forgiveness. Not because, uh, 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 what, not by sinning to make us happy. Okay? John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So what is the motivation of God's love? The motivation of God's love is, I mean, motivation of salvation is God's love. God loves the whole world. God loves everyone. And then whoever believes in Him, every person who believes in Him, sincerely, that we trust in Jesus as our Savior, we hold on to Jesus as our, as our Savior, then we are saved and born again. Now some people don't believe that. They don't believe that just by believing. Now we are saved by be believing in Jesus, trusting in Jesus as our Savior sincerely and then we'll bear fruit the fruit is the result the fruit is not the way of salvation when we trust in Jesus and bear fruit that's uh, you know and obey God that's the fruit of salvation so first we receive the salvation only by grace through faith only by trusting in Jesus Lord Jesus thank you for dying for me and I trust in you I'm sorry for my sins please forgive me then we are forgiven and saved and then after a person is saved, then he knows that God accepts him, God is happy with him, then he has the joy and the strength to overcome his sins and live in holiness. So the motivation to live in holiness is from the love of God and the acceptance of God. It's not by the law. Now many people obey by the law. Uh, the motivation is only from the law. And what happened is they would just say, I have to obey. If not, God will punish me. I have to obey. And they talk to people like that. You have to obey. You have to o obey. That is forcing people to obey by the law. It's, this is like a slave master telling the slave, you have to work, you have to work. If not, I'll beat you. It's not like that with God. Now, when you read the whole Bible, it's not like that. In the whole Bible, it's the grace of God, the love of God that compels us to obey Him. That, and whenever we repent, God is very happy. Whenever we obey Him, He is very happy and He will bless us. Whenever we love Him, then He will treasure us and He will bless us with things we have never imagined. Okay, but as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name. So all those who... Uh, Receive Him. Receive Him means to believe in Him. So what does believing mean? Believing is not just believing it with the head. Believing is accepting Jesus, receiving Him into our lives as our Savior and as our Master, as our Lord. So believing is not just believing in the head. Some people have this misconception. They think, I believe, I believe, so I'm saved. This believing is saying, Lord, come, Lord Jesus, I need you. I need you to forgive me. I need you to give me eternal life. So that is uh, believing in Jesus. That's receiving. And then everyone who receives Him will have uh, the right to become children of God. Everyone who receives Jesus has the right to become children of God. And then He will have the strength to bear fruit. So that source is the trust in Jesus the sincere repentance and trust in Jesus and then it will bring changes to the life of the person uh, and the person is not made the child of God by doing good we are made children of God when we accept Jesus as our Savior receive Him into our life as our Savior okay Romans 10 10 for it is with our heart that you believe and and are justified and then and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved so here it says that with your heart that you believe that you are justified you're 
you're made righteous. Justified means made righteous or called righteous. That we are not righteous, but God call, call us righteous. God cover us with His righteousness, but our nature is still sinful. Only when we die, when we go to heaven, and then we have a new, completely new nature and no more sinful nature when we are, are, are real Christians. So when we believe in our heart that we are justified, we are made righteous, and then it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So when we confess with our mouth, Yes, Lord Jesus, I want you to be my Savior, and then, um, then we are saved. So what does the Bible emphasize believing with our heart and professing with our mouth? So what the Bible says is, it's not just the mind believing, but the whole person believing that we will con profess our faith, we will say it out. The saying out proves that we really believe in our heart. When we really believe in our heart, then we will say it out. We'll say out uh, the, uh, that God is so wonderful. I'm thankful that God forgives me. I'm thankful that God for, uh, give me eternal life. So it's, it's not just believing, but believing that bears fruit. Believing with the heart and professing with the mouth signify what change to the person. So here it talks about the change of person already. That it's not just with the heart, but when the heart is open to Jesus, then he will have action. He will have fruit. Professing with the mouth is already the fruit of salvation. It's already changing. His life is changed by Jesus dying on the cross for him. When he trusts in Jesus, then his life is changed. Okay, and then the fruit of salvation. So I hope we all remember this. Uh, so first two related to salvation. Now these are not ways we are saved, but the fruit, the result of salvation. So related to salvation, the first fruit is continue to repent of our sins and turn away from sins. So when we really believe in Jesus, then, we, uh, then the life will hate sin and knows that sins have a consequence. So we, we uh, repent of our sin and turn away from our sins. And then continue to trust in Jesus as Savior and Master. So continue believing in Jesus, trust in Jesus. And I like this word trust better because trust is like relying on God. It's not just believing in the heart, relying on God, relying on Him for salvation. So these are the signs of being safe. Continue to repent and trust. And then related, related to relationship with God, that uh, the person will continue to have a close relationship with God, that who will pray to God, that who will read the Bible, that who will respond to the move of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit guide him to repent, then he will repent. The Holy Spirit guide him to obey God, then he will obey God. And when the Holy Spirit moves him to pray, then he will pray. Uh, uh, when the Holy Spirit moves him to do evangel evangelism, then he will do it. So, so he will... Uh, have this close relationship with God that there is a, a interaction that he would uh, pray to God and read the Bible and let the Word of God speak to him and then respond to the moves of the Holy Spirit so this is the close relationship there is an interactive relationship and then for love God with all the heart because when person have real faith in God then he will love him he would treasure God and say, you know, loving God means we treasure God. We see that God is very important. God is very precious. God is beautiful. God is loving. So we like God. We hold on to God. We are pleased with Him. So that's loving God and obeying God also. So loving God includes a number of factors that we appreciate Him. We hold on to Him. We thank Him. We like Him and we put Him in the first place in our life and we want to obey Him. And then the fruit related to good works. First, uh, number five would be to obey God, especially the Great Commission. And then number six, serve God, including glorifying God and blessing God 
uh, blessing people in Jesus in daily life and in ministry. So, so these are the six fruits. So we hope remember, and then we'll go through this the questions. So repent and turn away from sin. Trust in Jesus as Savior and Master, and a close relationship with God. Uh, love God, obey God, and serve God. And I hope you remember these six points. Okay, now continue repent of our sins and turn away from sins. John 5, 14, it, uh, Jesus says, Don't stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. 